Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, Corona Investing uh, Series. Uh, we have Braxton Gann on. Braxton, uh, thank you for coming on to the show. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And I, I just want to give a big shout out to the value investing community as a whole, who has been uh, not only very supportive of this podcast, but also very supportive of this series. And I think, you know, if anything, we can provide a service to investors who maybe aren't as you know tied in with all of us and we can you know bring some rationality and uh you know uh diminish some of that fear because people braxton i don't know if you if how aware you are of this but i mean the average person i mean they're they're freaking out over their investments or you know where they see a decline of 10 20 30 sometimes even upwards of 50 percent in their portfolio value in a week and it could it freaks people out yeah well, so, um, I guess uh, as long as you don't own Tesla, <laughs> then it should be okay, right? Hope, hopefully, I mean, I, I do think that there are gonna, there might be very well there'll be companies that do go to zero though in this. Yeah, it depends on what you own, right? Yeah, and if the you there's know, there's a lot of companies that have, like, um, you know, have conservative leverage ratios of seven times adjusted EBITDA, and they're they're not going to make it. Yeah, and this is the problem, you know, not only myself, but other people. I mean, we've been sounding the alarms on this for years that, you know, the the amount of people in the market that are actually doing valuation work is something like 10%. And the rest of it is algos, you know, and just certain kinds of passive investing mechanisms. And, you know, if someone has just been buying indiscriminately of any any interesting company that they think is cool, they've looked like a genius for the past you know, 10, 11 years. And now with people uh, experiencing real uh, impairments of the paper value of their portfolio, um, I don't think everyone's going to have a full recovery. And you know, some people will. But if you're not doing valuation work, it's, it's hard to know. Yeah. I think um, if you find you don't have to buy the market, you don't have to buy all uh, 5,000 stocks and uh, whatever total market index you're looking at. You can find just a few that the f- a few that aren't going to go bankrupt. Yeah. So speaking of that theme, um, I wanted to bring you on because, you know, we had you on a, you know, a few months ago and you talked about uh, tanker stocks and you're very, very knowledgeable about that industry. Um I mean, tell us about, you know, I mean, tanker stocks have been hit quite hard recently, haven't they? Yeah, it's uh, it's really unbelievable. Last time, uh, last time I said that, um, you know, well, Scorpio traded at $31 and I thought it was kind of cheap and uh, like on liquidation value and um, Diamond S shipping, I, like it traded half of liquidation value because it had just been spun out of a Ponzi scheme. And I said to buy it because I thought the gap would close. And it has closed, just uh, not in the direction I was expecting. Because now (laughs) Scorpio is at $12 and Diamond S shipping is at uh, $11. Now, the the bear thesis is going to be, you know, Corona is going to stop the world economy uh, for quite a while. Um, I haven't looked at every single shipping company, but I would imagine just the nature of the industry, a lot of them have a lo- have high levels of debt. Is that correct? Yeah. So the I would imagine the bear case is going to be, well, uh, shipping demand is going to fall off a cliff, meaning that many of these tanker companies uh, could potentially uh, not be able to pay off uh, their loans and the and the value of those ships uh, may also plummet, meaning that the book value is very very much overstated on the balance sheet, and you buying something at a fraction of quote unquote liquidation value may not actually be that. So, uh, would you say that's fair as the as the bear argument for for uh, tanker and shipping companies? 
Yeah, I think the concern is that the coronavirus will kill us all, and total annihilation of the world is really bad for tanker demand. Right. So what's so now? What? So, but let, let's say it is, it is even the end of the world. Let's just say, for instance, um, you know, things stop for six months or even twelve months. Let's just say, you know, in a bad scenario, it's twelve months. The shipping companies go all go bankrupt. Well, not all. there are like so many different sectors of shipping. There's container ships. There's dry bulk. There's cape sizes. There's uh, there's the LGCs, which take LPG. Uh, there's just so many different things, and they all have their different supply and demand. So you have to look at each one. Some of them will go bankrupt. Some of them won't go bankrupt. Do you still think in today, you know, and even in a good scenario, let's say this thing is over in three to six months, that uh, some of these will still go bankrupt? Uh, well, I mean, well, it depends. I don't think tankers will go bankrupt. I own plenty of them. Okay. Uh, cape sizes, though, like, you know, China has this huge program where they're building these giant cities with no one in them in order to boost their GDP so they can catch up with uh, the U.S. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, the coronavirus uh, is on the rampage and that kind of messes up their national malinvestment program. So they are importing steel. So all the steel and stuff they transport that goes on cape sizes. And so they're like, they don't, they're not even making enough to pay their crew. So right. there's, I'm looking at a company that I think could go bankrupt in in the very near future there. So I'm staying clear. Now, what are you buying in this industry right now? And what are you looking in, at? Well, I like the, the tankers, the ones that carry oil. Okay. I, I'm the do I don't really know which ones are. They're also cheap. I just I'm just buying them all. And what do you like about the tanker companies? There's well, if you look look back um, ten or twenty years uh, over their history, it's all about supply and supply and demand. When there's more supply than demand, which is like true ninety percent of the time, then they lose. Lots of money. They can't cover their operating costs. They they just bleed cash and have to raise equity at unfavorable prices. It's it's not fun. But in the brief periods of time where uh, they haven't been ordering new ships, they've been scrapping ships, and demand is catching up and outpacing supply, then they can make uh, huge amounts of money. Because well, if you're um, if you're China, you're not going to go back to rickshaws just because the price of transporting oil just went up three cents. Right. So what? And, do you, yeah, on, go ahead. Sorry. And on these companies, if you've got say uh, eight eight thousand or ten thousand in operating expenses for a, a crew tanker, then and then rates are uh, four thousand a day. You're not going to be too happy, but if they go to a hundred thousand a day, like they did uh, a few months ago, they're go you're going to be very happy because your costs are the same. Right. So, what what name specifically are you buying right now? Uh, I'm buying. I'm I'm buying Scorpio tankers. I'm buying Euronav. I'm buying DHT Holdings. I'm buying international seaways. There's like three or four others. And, and what percentage of your uh, portfolio is this? You know this theme. Oh, it's it's pretty high. It's double digits, definitely. Okay, got it. And are you just now? Are they currently losing money? These companies? No, this, they're not. Okay, so tell us about because I think people. So I already knew the answer to that question, but I think people think that right now they're losing money. So t tell us what's going on there. Why are they not losing money in this current environment where things have kind of fallen off a cliff? I'm actually buying them because of the coronavirus. Say, yeah, more. say, say more, please. Because this, is, this is why I have you on, so say more. <laughs> Three months ago, the, a lot of people bought in. They were really excited because they didn't realize that uh, tanker demand was seasonal. 
that people use less heating oil in March than they do in January. So they uh, have just been selling it off as the um, as the headline rates went down. But and it's true, they're right about the the coronavirus. The China hasn't been importing as much oil because all of the uh, all of everyone's just staying home and hiding from the coronavirus. But uh, but that's not going to go on forever. And even even though ha- even the rates that have been realized, those are surprisingly high given the circumstances. And like take uh, LR uh, the secondary effects of this are very interesting because uh, oil, for example, the demand the demand for oil is going down and everyone's panicking and selling the stocks because, well, why shouldn't oil tankers go down if oil's going down? But not really because what ha- what's happening is everyone knows that the coronavirus isn't going to last forever, that eventually the price of oil is going to go back up. So the smart thing to do is to buy it and store it on tankers. And more recently, the Russians uh, at their um, that their little little party uh, called OPEC, where they discussed uh, how to keep the price of oil up in their little cartel, the Russians decided that they didn't want to lower their production, even though demand was declining, because they didn't want to give a lifeline to all of the the U.S. producers that can't make any money, so they want don't want the competition. But the Saudis didn't like that, so they decided to do what anyone would do and dramatically increase their production. So there's just this huge surplus of oil, and and now now the forward cur- curve is going into Katango, which is Japanese for tankers making a lot of money. <laughs> So the tankers are actually making money through a charging to, to store the oil on their ships. Right. Even if and, they're not currently shipping it. Right. And it's uh, – I don't think people know this. Charter rates are at, are at all-time highs. They've never been higher, really. And they're, they're – supposedly rates were higher a few months ago, but a lot of those vessels at those high rates – didn't get fixed. These vessels now we're seeing charter rates of a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand for VLCCs, and they're getting what? It, tell, fixed. tell people what a VLCC is. That's a very large crude carrier. It's a really big tanker. It takes crude oil, and it can carry two million barrels. Okay. Interesting. So, and what kind of valuations are you looking at in the tanker sector? It's it's crazy. There's this uh, stocks at a thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, or sixty percent or more discounts to the to the the value of the boats. I mean, forget about book value. Look at what they could get if they sold the boats. Right. There's like a Scorpio tankers. The one company I'm looking at is at at twelve dollars, and if they sold all the boats off, they could pay. Uh, probably a uh, thirty-five dollar dividend. Now, are these companies? You said they're making money, right? So, yeah. what what kind of you know normalized earning yields are you looking at? Because I mean, this stuff is so volatile, earning wise that you can't look at any one given year, right? Um, normalized earnings, I'd say probably about negative ten percent return on equity. Okay, so they don't make money uh, over the long term. Right. Over one or two years, though, they can make a an outstanding amount of money if you're right. So, assuming you're right, are these companies going to be making you know close to their entire market cap or more? Yeah, there's this this one VLCC, uh, lots multiple VLCCs, but the, like one from Iran tankers, they chartered out th- this VLCC for on a voyage at a three hundred thousand dollars and like they're a lot they're not just that one but 
that that covers like a the VLCC was probably worth a sixty million dollars before they did that voyage, and now it's earning like a a two hundred percent return on equity, like without any leverage. That's crazy. So, do you expect that these tanker companies? I mean, do you expect that the tanker company has ever traded, ever actually traded book value, being that it's such a horrible industry? Yeah, look at the the two thousands. The all they all traded at substantial premiums, even though many of them were frauds, like mul- multiples of liquidation value. Because you know, people just don't have the discipline not to buy them when times are good. Right, if, and, and what what makes you say they were frauds? Can you can you elaborate on that? Well, they like um, well, dry ships is one. Now that, <laughs> that CEO is like, a little wacky, right? That's like the most um, most evil company ever. Would you would you share for entertainment purposes the story of dry ships? Yeah. Well, one day George Economou set up a little company, and he raised some a bunch of money for this exciting company and, and and just for the record this is a guy that if he is the ceo of your company you do not want that right yeah unless you're short shares of your own short. company yeah um so so he just um took this, this money and then he decided to like pay all of the, a bunch of money to him himself and he had like he was always using the company to buy boats from himself to sell boats to him to buy services from like his brother's nephew-in-law and it's uh like and in order to fund all this he kept selling more shares of the company at at massive discounts to what the they could have sold the ships for and uh you know people invested in it saying this is great i get to buy it at a discount except for that he was stealing all of the money so i calculate that if you would have invested a a billion dollars when it went public, you would now be able to buy 27 paper clips and a used ball of yarn. <laughs> Didn't he eventually take it public, uh, private? Yeah, he took it private. And I'm sure the people, uh, I'm sure he got a very good deal. Right. Huh. It's, a, it's wild. And there were, there was quite a few of those situations, right? Where you had these, uh, massively leveraged, uh, you know, tanker or you know any kind of shipping companies, and the, and the management were just you know basically stealing from the shareholders. Yeah, lots of those. Yeah. It's um slightly better now because some of those have gone bankrupt. A lot of them went bankrupt. Yeah, I was invested in one years ago called XL Maritime, and I made, I made money from it, but that also eventually went bankrupt too. Yeah. They took on a lot of debt at the worst possible time. That is a recurring theme in shipping. Which is weird that it's one of those industries that doesn't seem to act very rationally. Do you do you have any insight to why that is? Well, like once you think that markets would have worked that out by now? Yeah, I would have thought it, but apparently they haven't. These I guess it's just that by the time one sh- um, the last shipping bull market is over, all of the people who have been in, in who had experienced that bull market, they've already retired. Right, right. So, if you, just to, to leave listeners, if there was one or two picks in the tanker industry, are there are there are there one or two that are your favorite? Or are you just kind of buying uh buying them all? Ah. Uh. I own I own a lot of them, but my biggest positions are Scorpio tankers and Euronav and the DHT Holdings. So let's talk about Scorpio. Sure. So Scorpio is uh, it's a product tanker company. They don't carry crude. They carry uh, refined products like gasoline, diesel, m- middle distillates, uh, things like that. And it's uh, it was like a really exciting comp- uh, trend everyone was investing in for the past ten years. Product tankers, because the the refineries were moving closer to where they were drilling the oil, and 
and further from the consumer. So that meant more demand for product tankers to carry it all around. But of course, everyone figured this out. So they ordered so many ships that they that they completely canceled this out. So uh, the stock ticker on Scorpio is Sting, and if you look at the the ten year stock chart, you will you will figure out why it's called that. They they've not done very well. All right. So this so over the past uh, two or three years, they've essentially given up on ordering because they were losing so much money. So they haven't been building new ships. And while this has been happening, China has opened up these new teapot refineries where they're importing oil from uh, other countries, and then they're using it all all to refine it, and then they export that. So that's pushed up the the demand, and then there's this other refinery in Saudi Arabia that's opening up. It's uh, really big. And then there's this thing called IMO 2020, which says that you have to burn bunker fuel with a sulfur content of 0.5% uh, sulfur content or less. And the nice thing about that for Scorpio is that all of those low sulfur fuels are clean products and they're carried on product tankers. They have to take the the marine gas oil and the blend, and the components to make VLSO. Oblins, which is another type of low sulfur fuel. Yeah. So there's all this, all this demand for it. It's growing, and but there aren't the new ships coming in to meet this demand. And over the past 18 months, the it's there's a very clear trend. Every month, the tanker rates for these things have been higher than than like 12 months ago for uh like uh it's been very consistent right interesting and it and this is um uh not an ordinary ceo well it's a tanker ceo he bought like two million dollars of call options like uh on the open market i don't think i've and that recently i haven't seen that before and the stock is down significantly from when he, he bought those. The last time he did this, he went on like a, an international stock pumping campaign. So I'm pretty sure that the stock price is going to go up fairly soon. Well, I hope so, for your for your sake as well. Yes. All right, Braxton. Well, any other... Uh... Any other things you want to say about uh, that company or the industry as a whole, or you want to wrap it up? Uh, no, it's it's very it's very interesting because you see they, there's all these Chinese. You, where do they make the ships? Uh, most of the ships are made in in Asia, like forty percent in China. So the workers haven't been showing up in China because they don't want to get the coronavirus. So the shipyards have been having these three or six months of delays where they're not building the ships. And even in Japan or South Korea, they rely heavily on parts from from South from China. So the ships just aren't getting built. Now, are any of the shipyard companies public? Uh, yeah, I believe a few of them are Jap- Japanese and Korean. And what what are your thoughts on shipyard businesses? Um. Well. I, I haven't really looked at them. I don't think that the. I don't think you make as much money when times are good in the shipyards as you do in the shipping companies. Well, that's that's for sure. The shipyards, and I don't think. See, everyone says they're going to order new ships. That's true, but we don't know exactly when all of this new ordering is going to happen. It could be pushed out, three months, six months, because they have to have to have to pay down debt there. A lot of them are public companies that trade at 50% discounts to nav. So they're, they're going to buy back stock there. Um, and then there's this thing called IMO 2030. That means that essentially there are a bunch of guys sitting in a room saying that you need saying to the shipping industry, 
you need to clean up your act. In 10 years, if you don't, if your vessels aren't right, meeting the right specifications, they're going to be obsolete. Uh, we haven't decided quite what the specifications are, but but trust me, you don't want to build the wrong ships. So they don't. So the shipping companies they don't know what what to build, how they're going to meet the new requirements. So like um, some people say it's going to be liquefied natural gas. Some people say it's going to be biofuel. But no one some really people, knows. Yeah, I have a friend who says they're going to use Duracell. What is it? Duracell, the battery. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I haven't really figured out how that's going to work. I was, is he joking or does he really mean that? Uh, I think he has. He, he knows a lot more about science than me. Huh. I like flunk science. Okay. Yeah, I don't know any. I don't, when it comes to best fuel sources, that is completely outside my uh, pay grade. So, so look at, at Scorpio. It's got, yeah. it's, it's, uh, they have a lot of, young vessels they have uh, i believe the youngest fleet of any public shipping of any public tanker company unless there's one i haven't felt i've haven't seen yet uh hiding somewhere in zimbabwe but so they um it's a market that's a lot dependent on the age of the fleet more so than in other segments because at about 15 years of age the epoxy lining in the tanker starts to break down so there's really a two-tier market where uh, you, older than 15 years of age, a lot of charterers won't touch you. Right. And there's a lot of these co- those companies, the fraud corps that started up in the, the 2000s when the times were good, they built those ships, and now they're turning 15 years of age and older. So, And that's actually now with all of these shipyards delays, that's substantially exceeding – the number of ships that are that are going to hit the water, and you know that's before we even talk about scrapping, which if rates stay where they are now, that's not going to happen. Right. Interesting. So, is, would you say Scorpio is your favorite? If you had to pick one, I don't know. It's it's the uh, you really just got to buy the basket. It's, in your, it's in the your cheapest. View. It's the cheapest I own. Mm-hmm. It's one of the cheapest I own. Who do you think has the best management team in the tanker industry? Is probably, there... probably you're an app, or, or perhaps Frontline. They're pretty smart. This first, is, Jim... is, is Frontline cheap right now? You think? No, okay. it's not cheap. But there's this guy in charge who he always, when um, things are about to turn, he always adds all this leverage to buy ships, and then he pays out big dividends, and then the stock goes really high, and then he issues stock to buy to uh, pay down debt or buy ships or whatever so so they're a more rational player in the industry frontline yeah have the returns been okay or they still suck they they've made i if you and i haven't quite looked at it the but the, the returns have been very good for the ceo he's a billionaire uh yeah. what, about for the, like, what about for the shareholders <laughs> I haven't looked. I haven't actually done an analysis, but I know that that uh, if you invested at the peak, um, the trough, uh, twenty years ago, then you would have received multiples of your market cap and dividends. So definitely more than twenty-seven paper clips is what you're saying. Yeah, definitely more than twenty-seven paper clips. <laughs> Got it. All right. On, on, on that note, I think we should wrap it up. Um, but Braxton, it was a pleasure to, uh, have you on and, uh, you're welcome to come back anytime. Well, nice talking to you. All right. Take care, Braxton. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.